Hello and welcome to Diminishing Returns. We're here to review the films of 2021. My name is Alan. I'm here, as always, with the beautiful Sol Harris. Oh. <laughs> and the confusing Calvin Dyson. C- confusing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's making me, Alan question uh, his his uh, <laughs> you know, my what <laughs> relationship with the male form. Um, <laughs> I've never questioned that. It's always been acceptable to me. That's true. Actually, you've always been one of the most open-minded people I've ever known. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. So, review of the year. It's been. Um, I would say it's been a really crap year for film uh probably down to the pandemic i think last year more or less got away with it just about and now we're kind of really feeling that um lack of things going into production or the things that did kind of get into production being impacted by covid protocols i went to a party last night with some um Mm. film people and uh i don't mean i don't mean party I don't mean industry. The cocaine I mean was pe- flowing. <laughs> I mean people who people who like to talk about films is what I meant. Oh. Like letterboxed bros, you know. <laughs> the, the Mountain Dew was flowing. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I I said that it's been a crap year for film, and then you know this guy was like, no, 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 and then he he proceeded to list off a whole load of twenty twenty films that he considers twenty twenty one because they came out in the UK in like January or something. Just for the record, we're not going to be talking about Sound of Metal or um, Did it. The Father. <laughs> Did it from the Oscars special. Did them both exactly. from the Oscars special, mate. Cover yeah, them. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you about my sort of film year. I think I've been to the cinema about four times in the last two years. And most of that was the last week, right? Because I told you you have to watch <laughs> a load of stuff for this episode. Uh, no, I've only been once at th- this week. Uh, I went to see Matrix yesterday. I saw No Time to Die. A few months back. I think the last film I saw before that was Bill and Ted. So, yeah, it's not been a good time for me in the cinema. And I've Mm. not missed it. And I made the decision the other day to cancel my Cineworld Unlimited uh, membership. Mm. Which I've had for, you know, 16 years or something. Why now? Why not when nothing was coming out and you weren't going to the cinema? I'll tell you what I saw. Because I have switched my allegiance to Picture House Cinemas. Oh, very good. Yes. And I'll tell you why. I looked into it, and basically, I live in Brixton. There's a the Ritzy in Brixton, which is about a seven-minute walk from my house. Which is actually uh, owned by Cineworld, I believe. But oh, Picture know. Houses are all, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so so that's why I can't putting feel... Putting your money in the same that's, people's pockets. That's why I don't have to feel bad about not helping <laughs> my corporate overlords. Um... <laughs> But yeah, and there's also, from where I live, there's three other picture house cinemas within sort right, of 20 right. to 30 minute walking distance. Well, yeah, very good decision. Though. So it was just like, I live in the perfect spot and uh, I've got their membership thing. It's a, it's a decent deal. But really what, what won me over is that they do a thing called Happy Mondays uh, where the mem- members get tickets for £5 for any showing on a Monday. So, you know, I've I've got the... I've got the free scheduling in my life to be able to work that. So, you know, this isn't an advert for Picture House Cinemas. But... So you're paying for a membership, <laughs> but you don't get to see all the films you want anymore? No, it doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. You get, uh... you pay you pay a certain amount, you get a certain number of tickets for that, you get little perks and stuff. It's, mm. it's not as good a deal as the Cineworld thing if you're going to be going a lot. But I think I'm going to end up going more just because it's right on my doorstep and I can just sort of pop out and... One evening, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm just going to pop to the thing. They showed a lot of old classics, from what I remember. Which they I and they do well. they they're like five pound tickets for the for yeah, the classic yeah. screenings as well. So yeah, I'm I'm hoping it might kind of rejuvenate my uh, cinema mm. going a little bit. Well, I, I'm in a similar position. I I switched allegiance to Odeon just because I now live in uh, Manchester and I can walk there. I mean, I'm not I'm not being funny, guys. I'm not as impressed with uh, Odeon as a chain so far. Mm. The, the app, the website, it's all, none of it quite works as well. The seats aren't as comfy, but um, <laughs> at the end of the day, who cares? I can I can walk to the cinema and That's it, pop along, to. watch House of Gucci on a whim, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of, Calvin, I bet you're mm. dying to watch House of Gucci but haven't seen it. Would that be... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks right up my street. I'm really looking forward to seeing it probably whenever it's out on some kind of premium on-demand service, which is how I've seen a lot of films this year. I've seen yeah. two films at the cinema this year, one of them four times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no no Time to Die and Halloween Kills. I'll let you guess which you one. Halloween Kills the, four yeah. times? <laughs> wow. I'm looking at my films of 2021, so my list of like everything I've seen from 2021. This unfortunately will not be a particularly accurate list of... Um, everything I've seen at the cinema, because I'm sure I did see some, like, 2020 movies that came out here this year, mm. but I'm just going to add up what I saw in the cinema. Mm. I've, I've seen plenty on um, the premium on-demand thing. I've gotten quite into that. Uh, I think I watched yeah, Candyman that way. streamed quite a lot of things. Oh, well, I, I don't do that, but I you know, well, you go on Amazon. And... You don't admit to doing it. Mm. <laughs> no, no, to be fair, to be fair, I have a Netflix... I don't have a net. I have access to a Netflix account, so you know that helps. <laughs> oh, I did it for Black Widow as well. Did the premium thing for that? Ugh. How much do you pay for that kind of thing? That was about fifteen pounds, I think. Uh, on top of the Disney Plus subscription as well. So, it's it's, uh, I mean, you look at it as like, I mean, the cinema tickets are not far off that anyway. Yeah, they're they're priced for like a family of four to see it as worth their That's true time. actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking of I'm just buying it for myself. Yeah, I guess they're working towards yeah, you per household, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. If you're taking yeah. two kids to the cinema, that's pretty expensive, isn't it? I've added up and I've seen I believe 30 films in the cinema uh, this past year, which is pretty You good might going, be single-handedly actually. keeping the industry alive, so. Yeah. yeah. I say 30 I've seen 29 films in the cinema, but I went to see Spider-Man a second time, so it's 30 uh, trips. If I could go during the day, like on a weekday, more often, I would totally do that. Because, like, mm, yeah, seeing Halloween it. Kills, um, you know, just going down on, like, a whenever it was, like, a Wednesday morning or something. It was brilliant, mm. uh, just by myself. It's great, isn't it? No, I love it. It's I nice, love it. Yeah. I really do. And, yeah. and uh, in the city centre, it, it, it feels like people don't go to the cinema as much there. It seems like quite an unused mm. cinema, so it's usually quite sparsely uh, populated. Um mm. Tell you what was weird, actually. I, I went to see The Kingsman the other day. Uh, more on that later. Mm. People clapped at the end. Hmm. And I, wow. I, I, I think that's... To, re- you had to renounce your membership immediately and say, this is well, the sort of place <laughs> I want to be. I think it's residual excitement from Spider-Man left over. I think they were so excited <laughs> from when they went to see Spider-Man that they were like, you know, I, g- we, I guess we... Look... I get spoiler alert. Saul obviously loves the new Spider-Man film because he's just making up all kinds of nonsense. Now. No, Pete, it's because well, you've Alan, got it's residual love to... for Spider-Man doesn't mean other people have. Alan, it's currently number fifteen in IMDb's top two hundred and fifty movies of all time. It's currently in the Letterbox two hundred and fifty. Yeah, but you're time, you're claiming really that upsetting. that means that random people in Manchester enjoy the King's Man more because of it. I don't know, <laughs> why, I don't know where you've made a huge leap there. What's that? Because I've never seen people clap in a fucking cinema before. Maybe it was like a busload of Americans or something. Oh, maybe. I don't <laughs> think so. Let's see a British movie. <laughs> the King's Man. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, should we dive right in with um, the first one here, which is A Quiet Place Part 2. We, we put our Quiet Place episode out in like uh, 20... 2018, 2019, <laughs> didn't we? God. Well, did we? Did we? Did we let it sit on a shelf? I can't remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it went out, and then the pandemic hit, and then so they cancelled the movie for two years, and it came out this year. But I feel like a quiet place, like The Purge, that we'll talk about later, really benefited from the pandemic in that it just made their sort of post-apocalyptic ideas become more realistic sound seeming. Yeah, yeah. I guess prisoners could... in their own homes. Draw hmm. some parallels between <laughs> putting on a mask and having to be quiet. It's not quite the same thing, but uh... <laughs> some people should just put on a mask and be quiet, though. Am I right? Not allowed to say what you yeah. think these days. Oh. Uh. Um, anyway, here's here's what we thought of it with uh, with special guest Connor Murray. So, if you want my broad opinion. It was just more of the same, and added nothing, brought nothing new to the table, and had lost the novelty of the first one, so had nothing I mean, to that's, offer. That's similar to me. I, I think it's more of the same, but just a lot worse. 
But that is is it worse just because we've already seen it before? No, no, it was definitely a lot more ridiculously stupid this time yeah, around. Definitely. I, I wish I could remember specifics of it, but there was a lot more why is this character doing this? Why are they not just doing this? They know how to kill these things. Why are they not making use of it now? It was just stupid. And 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 there was just really lazy crap writing. Like they obviously put all of the time and effort into the opening 10 15 minutes which to be fair yeah were very good i wouldn't say they were mind blowing as some people seem to think but i think they were a cut above most of the first film they were a great little action scene but they wouldn't have been able to do it in the first film because of the budget but, yeah. yeah that's but even that had the bullshit of people taking forever to latch on that not not even these things are attracted to sound but just like like you might not um, immediately click right these things can only hear but you would probably just assume they can see and hear so why would you be talking at full volume <laughs> who has their phone on full volume anyway <laughs> old people it wasn't an old person's phone it was like a young woman's phone no one has their Actually, phone Actually I I think uh Sol I had the opposite feeling in that scene because it seemed to me that the John Krasinski... John Krasinski immediately figures out what's going on. Another problem with it, yeah. Yeah, it was too quick to understand. Like, in that thing, everyone would be panicking. The fact that they went indoors and hid under tables but and you were would, generally But you quiet. would go, shh, shh, be quiet, it's outside, it'll hear us. Even if yeah, it can yeah, see, yeah. don't move, be still, <laughs> and it, I, be I just quiet. felt that there should be far more panic. People yeah. are not reasonable and logical in a situation like that. And maybe one or two, uh, if John Krasinski is going to be you know, sensible, I will buy that, because he's yeah, something yeah. different about him or whatever. But also, in that scene, how quickly people were to react, before there's an actual creature on the ground and like, okay, this is definitely The, the, the fireball in the sky. Yeah. I hated that as well, because I was like, that is far enough away to not be a danger, and it's going way too slowly to be an asteroid, so why the fuck is everyone leaving the ball game? I don't think your average person at a ball game in the middle of rural America is necessarily going to go, well, it's going too slowly to be an asteroid. So that <laughs> but it's extremely safe. far away as well, you know? It's like, like humans, like we have a good sort of instinctual sense for danger. Yeah, that thing in I the mean... sky was not a danger. If a some hurricane was coming some in, would. some people would hang around and watch. Uh, from like judging from the pandemic, about half the people at that place wouldn't even believe it was happening. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I I remember having, politics. but also there's just to be more specific, the John Krasinski character and the wife character are both both respond with just immediate. I understand what to do in this situation to be safe, and I get that it's like. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get my kid out of this. I'm protecting my child. I'm going to get them out of this situation and like drive away, drive away. But it's all too calm. It's all a little bit too like James Bond, cool under pressure kind of situation. Yeah, and because not, John they're, Krasinski they're to wrote be... and directed and starred in <laughs> as John Krasinski. Instead of immediately going, oh, look, there's a creature, let's run away. Like, have a couple of seconds ago, what the fuck is that? What is going on? Oh my god, yeah. it's coming towards me, let's run away. A moment where John Krasinski looks to the camera and kind of does a mmm kind of face. Like, <laughs> can you believe it? <laughs> can you believe what we put up with here? <laughs> but then it jump it jumps into post-apocalyptic territory again, and it's fairly, uh, as, as we were in the first film. It does expand a little bit. They get them out of the little farmhouse. Again, I, I saw this with my, my most recent ex at the cinema, and, and she got very annoyed with me, because my, my general attitude was, pick up a rock and like silence that baby, it's going to kill everyone. And she didn't like that at all. <laughs> Funny but that. You, you <laughs> throw, even, throw it into the play. I mean, I'm starting to <laughs> understand why she's an ex now. You know, you just seem to be constantly <laughs> annoying her in these no, I, 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 I I'll tell you specifically, <laughs> that was a different ex. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you specifically about, th there was a moment where she got really angry with me because it, it's the bit where that kid, the boy, steps in a bear trap and then starts going, ah! <laughs> and she's like, shut up. You know why you can't make noise even though it hurts. And he's there just going, ah! <laughs> and it's like, Come on, you would know not to make noise, and yeah, it would be excruciatingly painful, but you can silence pain and and just let him go. He's dead. <laughs> Save the daughter. <laughs> 
if he's going to be that stupid and selfish. And there were so many points where people were just making noise and it didn't matter. But then See, I don't understand. Where... Like, I don't understand why they didn't have that speaker going all the time. You know, with like the feedback yeah. loop just all the time. If one appears, just shock on it. Yeah. You know, national pride aside, I legit think Killian Murphy was brilliant in it. All right, I'll, I'll tell you why he's not right because his character is just the same John Krasinski character. He's a bit more of a good old boy. Well, yeah, they had to they had to go back and try and make him different. I said best thing in it. I didn't say good. <laughs> All right, fair point. Fair but point. I do think you know, given his material, I think he did very well. There's something about him that is very good in apocalyptic situations, and I think this played to his strength. Nothing happens yeah. with the characters. There's the no, question. There's no art. The question was answered too quick of whether or not he's trustable. Very yeah, quickly, it's yeah, just like, yeah. oh, he's a good guy. Okay, and then that's it. There's zero. He's a conflict. good guy, and obviously he's got doubts about things. But you know, yeah, he should. Yeah, a bit more sinister there, or potential for it. Just some sort of dramatic tension. <laughs> but they, but they but the obvious the obvious thing to do with this sequel is to make it about the bigger world, the the post apocalyptic world, and the people therein. So I was expecting something along more along the lines of like, oh, actually, the people who are left, what have they become? They're scavengers. And we get that, but we get it for this one scene of about four minutes. But yeah, the, the, the girl goes off on her own. Uh, the, the man goes off after her and then is, you know, convinced to, to join her because he realizes it's the correct thing to do. They don't go back and let them know that they're gonna, just going to pop away for a few days. <laughs> yeah. So obviously the mum just thinks they're dead. And so she abandons her boy. <laughs> she abandoned her child. I she abandoned, abandoned my boy. <laughs> <laughs> she goes to abandon the boy to go and do some shopping, and uh, that's the modern modern malaise, isn't it? Like, that's, did that's you think there was something satire. really fucked up about the end, and that Hart sort of tried to still tie the family together as working together, but they actually weren't completely at all. Yeah. Well, it's sort of like in two halves. It's this sister. Um, you know, angrily shoving her hearing aid against the microphone and saving the world. And that, meanwhile, the boy oh, yeah. is, I don't know, shooting the alien oh, and they're waiting overcoming for the radio his signal fear of something. Yeah. I don't know what sort of journey he went yeah, on during it, yeah, other yeah. than just crying. Oh, that was it. There's a there's a real heroic moment where he brutally murders a creature, which, you know, fair enough, in self-defense and, and you've got to kill this creature that's going to kill you. But it's it's all just a little bit too slow motion swelling music celebration of guns that we're going to save the world with by killing things they Ooh. go to an island and discover life going by as normal in a sort of quaint old fashioned way and they fuck it up for everybody by bringing some creatures along with <laughs> That's them. exactly what I was about. I was so tempted to jump in there and be like, and then they fuck it up immediately. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I was living in an island colony in a world inhabited by monsters, and I know they can't get over the water, I would have sentries p- posted yeah. at every possible landing point, mm-hmm. and any boat that came up would be thoroughly Shot. checked at arm's yeah. length before. <laughs> now, if there's people, you know, you want to welcome people in, yeah. but it'd be like, have you got any creatures on there? You know, if you were living on an island surrounded by monsters, you know, you do realize you've just described how the UK currently sees itself right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, just, just, just to get here. Connor is here. Bringing, bringing the satire. <laughs> the, monsters are, the monsters are already here. Right? I'm already living among them. They already came over in their boat and they're fucking up your shit right now. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, I, I feel like I've been really negative about it, and I think that's more a reaction to how positive people are about these films in general. But my my initial rating after seeing it was six out of ten. But I I didn't hate it, you know. Yeah, I so, yeah, I'm six I'm on the same place really. Um, I've thrown a lot of negativity out of here, but it was it was a perfectly watchable thing. My problem with it was just did nothing new and yeah was a bit like so so whatever. Uh, but I give it a six out of ten. Yeah, it just sort of does what it does. God, yes, yeah. so they're both so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> nah, for me it's a straight up four out of ten, two out of five. Both of those stars are Killian Murphy. <laughs> Calvin, by the way, I, I'm going to assume you've seen none of these films, so <laughs> when we get to one you oh. have seen, jump in and, yes. and we'll, uh, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. No, let's, let's do it this way. Calvin, what do you think you'll think of A Quiet Place Part 2? Uh, I think I'll probably enjoy it, because I quite like the first one, uh, but I'm, yeah, it's probably so. much the same, and I might be annoyed how John Krasinski apparently comes back in some way. That, that's well, all let, I know about it. Let me, let me ask you this. This came up in our, our little discussion. Can you name an mm. Irish actor that Connor doesn't like? 
Oh, hmm. And and this is Irish or Northern Irish. They both count. Can't they? <laughs> he, he has a, a real unified uh, head. He's old school. When it comes to uh, <laughs> Jamie Dornan. I reckon Connor would like him. I reckon he'd go. Yeah, good guy, good buddy. He did that show with Gillian He's Anderson where he played a killer. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I'm looking at uh, just a list of Irish actors, and it's like, oh, yeah, actually, all these people are pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he likes Aidan Gillen, uh, who was in Game of Thrones. Uh, that, you might, might be I, thinking I, of me there, because I, I think he's a knob. Oh, damn it, I'm thinking of you, aren't I? Yeah. Most, I, I will say, something that I've discovered this year is most... Most actors from Game of Thrones, when they turn up in things that aren't Game of Thrones, I'm not familiar with them because I, you know, I gave up on Game of Thrones quite soon. I didn't like it. So I just keep watching things and being like, wow, who is this awful actor they've found for this thing? And then looking it up afterwards and, oh, oh, it's Kit Harrington. Oh, I, well, there's no way he auditioned. For <laughs> I was just film. about to throw Kit Harrington under the bus there. I thought, oh, no, that's hard. I, I genuinely know. I, I watched, I went to see Marvel's Eternals. And, like, there's some pretty ropey acting in that film, full stop, but the one that performance that really stood out to me was the, the boyfriend character. I was like, wow, this guy is awful. Like, really <laughs> bad. And then, yeah, Kit Harrington. Couldn't believe it. All right. Uh, should we move on to hmm. film number two? Uh, Calvin, do you remember when we spoke about Escape Room? Oh, my God, that was so long ago now. It was, Yeah, I do it? remember that. Fucking ages yeah. ago. Well, Escape Room 2 did come out. And uh, here's what we thought of it. But the the first question here, Sol, is which version did you watch? I wa I watched the theatrical cut, Alan. I was presented on uh, the Blu-ray that I rented out. I was presented with the option to watch either or. And I thought, fuck watching a longer version of a film. Well, I, I, fa I watched the, th the longer version... Not deliberately. I, I didn't realise there was more than one version until after I'd watched it and I was reading about it. I assumed it was just like an extra scene or two. What you're saying? No, is no, totally no. Different. It is it is a considerably different plot what? element that is uh, in, involved in the yes. I tell you what. Let's talk about the version you watched and then I'll kind of catch you up on what what else happened. All right. Is the extended version? the original version because one of my issues with this movie was the the beginning felt so disjointed and like i couldn't connect with any of the characters yes i think that the long version is the original thing that they filmed and then they cut some they cut something quite significant out to create a simpler and shorter film can i can i ask, like obviously the, in the first movie the escape rooms are very elaborate like, they're nicely built sets. They've put a lot of time and effort into making these little rooms. But I felt like in this one, it kind of got into, like, magic territory, you know? Like, they, yeah. had, they had sand in this movie that doesn't behave like sand. And it's like, one minute it's normal sand, but, like, it's if someone can magically press a button and it turns into sand that you fall through... It was like, right, well, there's, there's magic sand rising up that they're going to drown in. That's not a real thing. Therefore, I can't even, like, engage with it on a mm -hmm. level of what would I do. It just, it was annoying. And and I, I just, I feel like the bank one was so weak. And to be honest, that electric one was really weak. That I just, I, I just, I switched off and I just oh, lost dear, all already. goodwill for this film. Because, like I say, some of the later rooms were a bit better, but I just, it was too little too late, you know? But I like the idea that all these so all these people had different themes to their escape room games. Uh, so you know, just in terms of a person who is actually one of the Illuminati who is watching these games, mm. um, I really like that. You know, the, oh, it's like it's like Big Brother. It's like oh, it's oh the theme this year. It's priests. Look, we've got six priests. <laughs> We're like what? <laughs> At least have given us like a priest, a rabbi. And, uh, you know, whatever the others do. <laughs> like, at least give us one of each religion yeah. to see who, yeah. is the, who is the best religion. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you think they missed a trick in Escape Room by making this guy a priest instead of a bishop? Because then he would have only been able to move diagonally across that floor. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been a clue. <laughs> That's how I would do it, Alan. My theme would be chess, and that would actually—I would get you'd get a bishop, a knight, a pawn, a pawn star to be the, the pawn, 
a rookie, <laughs> like a someone who's that. brand new at their job. Uh, uh, for the rook, rook. okay, yeah. We just uh, um, um, you need a queen, a drag. Yeah, queen. but that but that can be like yes, queen, like yeah, yeah. queens, like King Burger King, Do- Don King, yeah, Stephen <laughs> King, <laughs> Stephen King, yeah, that's who you want. Yeah. He would be great because he'd be he'd be going on about how this is just like one of his stories, and <laughs> oh, I'm a writer, I know, I understand story structure. This means that this is going to be this. Look, room one's chess. Room two. Room one is, is sorted. That's good. But... Yeah, room two can just be a beach or something like here. There's no, there's no like fucking reason or rhyme to any of the rooms in these films. Well, there is. Oh, I don't think I was paying attention. What was it? <laughs> yeah, what happens next? Uh, someone we thought was dead from the first film is there. Oh, and and the guy who died in the sand isn't dead. He's in a tank of water, like David Blaine or something, and um. Then the the woman from the first film who died didn't die. She's like, look, sorry, they made me uh they made me be the new game master because obviously if you survive a couple of escape rooms, even if you die on like the third one, that still means you're like a game making genius. So they they actually use us all to make the next games. But that's it. Yeah, she didn't even get through. She wasn't the survive. There were two people out of six survived that, and she wasn't one of them. Yeah. She can be like, oh, I've got a kid, and so I th- they kidnapped her and made me do this to justify why I should do it. And then it's like, so I themed... This was the theme of the rooms. It was like a lovely day they had uh, out. Uh, right, yeah. You, so is, like, oh, yeah. me and my mummy went to the beach, then we got a taxi home, and it rained. Yeah, that was the theme. You're right, I forgot. Yeah, exactly. And then what? She's like, right, you have to take over now. Set me free. They'll set. Up, they'll let us all live if uh, if you become the next game master. And she refuses. But yeah, they, she goes, they've got no. That. They've got no leverage on her because she's got no family or friends to threaten. Except threaten, for this guy this that guy she guy met a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, but she's friends with him. But she breaks the system. She doesn't play their game. She burns the fucking building down, literally. All right. So what happens in the other version that you watched? What's so different? Right at the beginning, instead of all that stuff with her talking to a therapist and doing some exposition stuff, what we get is a flashback scene to 2003, I think it was, and we see a family. And this family is a young girl of about 12 and her mother, and they've been on a day out somewhere. They come back home, and the father of the family is sat in his office, and he's working away building an escape room. And the mother's like, "Look, you can't, you can't do this. It's it's driving you mad. You're you're working too hard." And and he's like, "You know what will happen if I don't meet these deadlines. You know what these people are like." And so she's pissed off, and she goes down to have a swim, and then she goes into the sauna, and the sauna locks, and it turns out to be a, a game, and uh, she tries to escape from the sauna, and and solve the clues and she doesn't make it in time and she dies and it's like oh this evil man who's killed his wife because he's doing does escape rooms oh that's basically the start and then sort of periodically throughout the film which is now set in the modern day we see this guy who's the escape room designer guy and he's like doing things and then we see that his daughter who was 12 or whatever is now an adult woman and he's got her locked in like a, a glass pad. Can of I stop cell. you? Yeah. <laughs> I think the theatrical cut's better. <laughs> well, obviously, my explanation of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, carry on. Go on. So he's got her locked in this room because she's like autistic or something. And so she creates all these amazing puzzles. So then we have the game as you'd see it until. The, the the acid rain bit, she gets into the taxi, she falls down through the taxi, and she wakes up in a little vestibule next to this woman's cell. So then she's like, so she's like, look, I'm trapped in the cell, but because my crazy dad is like a puzzle crazy, he's created this puzzle that if we solve it, I'll get out, and, I, and but I need your help because I can't solve it alone. And so they basically work together to to solve this puzzle. She gets out. The dad comes down. He's like, oh, I'm very angry that you've got out. They kill him. But then here's the twist, you see. Here's the twist. It turns out 
that the girl who was locked in a cell was locked there because her dad realized she was an evil genius who created puzzles to kill people. <laughs> and so he that was his way of controlling her. And actually, she is now, <laughs> now free. she's unleashed upon the world. It's like the she Howling is... Man, the short story where <laughs> the guy finds a, a poor old man locked up in this like mon- ancient monastery. And he's like, let this poor man out. And then he does it. He, he like overpowers the evil people keeping him you know captive and then the guy's like ha ha i tricked you i'm the devil <laughs> it is exactly that yes that is correct yes it does sound better i have to say it does sound like it makes everything a bit more logical and work better well certainly i i enjoyed it a bit more i think than you did and but i think i think i liked it in general just because it engaged me i was like on the edge of my seat like ooh, what's going to happen next where are they going to come out in the same way that i did the first one and it it worked for me on that level still well i i really struggled with the pacing of the thing and like something about the editing was off and it makes me think that maybe that's the theatrical cut i mean anyway i give it three out of ten alan which uh, whoa ouch yeah I mean, maybe I was in a bad mood. I don't know. I, just... <laughs> I gave it a seven. Wow. Which is the same that I gave the first one, which when I look back, I thought, okay, the first one's definitely better. This is just kind of doing the same things. Maybe a six would be more relevant, but it, it, I felt like I enjoyed it. I, it was worth watching. I just thought, yeah, that was all right. Seven. I'll give it a seven. Oh, I'm escaping us out of this clip. Alan. Mm, yeah. <laughs> now, if if you're listening to these clips and you're like, where are these clips from? Why are they so truncated? I'd like to hear the full thing. <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash dim returns for four, uh, what is it now, Alan? Three pounds a month for the Diminisodes. Ooh, yeah. You can join up for one pound a month for access to other things. Uh, but three pounds a month will get you access to all our Diminisodes. You'll hear all these reviews of films as they come out. Some of these came out in, I don't know, March? Like, More earlier time. this year, you know? And uh, most of these run for about 30, 40 minutes because we, we're we very bad at having the um, self-restraint to stop recording after 15 minutes like we're supposed to. <laughs> well, we're a lot looser on the Diminisos in terms of our gen- yeah tangents and a bit of, uh, bit of the old banter, as they say, as the kids say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we, but with, uh, with proper episodes, we try and be a bit more efficient. Yeah, well, you you do in the edit. I, I noticed yeah. you you chopped yeah. our two hour Star Wars holiday special episode down to about fifty minutes. So yeah, I've not I chopped it down to, to the bits yet. where we were talking about Star Wars holiday special. Well, we spent about forty minutes talking about our sex lives. I think before. Yeah, I cut twenty six minutes out of the first thirty. So <laughs> <laughs> good shit. Anyway, should we do should we do a music quiz? Oh. This, part one of the music quiz, this is uh, four original songs from films of the year 2021. And TV. Mm. Uh, I mixed in a little bit of TV in with the films. Just Something to, I watch know, even less than films. Yeah, just just to pad things out, because, you know, there weren't many films this year. So for this, I will award a point for the name of the song, the artist, and, of course, the film or TV show in question. All right, let's let's do it. If I should build a wall, a wall built just for you, a tale of songs and fury, with no taboo, to sing and die for you. Yes, in minor mm-hmm. keys, and if you want us to kill too, we, we may agree. So may we start. Confusing. Hmm. I, I'm sure I heard someone say "No time to sty." <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of Bond parody. Um, I don't think you heard that, but uh, <laughs> maybe you did. I, I don't know. It sounded like a David Bowie tribute act. It did, didn't it? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't recognize that. Give me well, some like casting that. ideas for a for a Bowie biopic there. But, uh... <laughs> I I will say that uh, one of the actors you heard there is one of my firm favourites at this point. I I love the guy. Rami Malek? 
you may have heard a, a French accent in there as well. Uh, the the music for this film was uh, written by a band that have had a real moment this year, thanks to a couple of films, actually. Uh, but no, th- this is quite a hard one to start. So uh, that was a song called So May We Start from Annette, which was Annette. Uh, a film by the, the band Sparks. Um, Edgar mm. Wright did a documentary about them this year as well, Sparks Brothers. Uh, and so I would have accepted Sparks or Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard and uh, Simon Hilberg, I believe, who were actually singing that song. It's um, it's a good song. Annette is a really interesting film. It didn't really work overall. Um, I think that's what happens when you let a band write a film. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like if you've ever seen Tommy by The Who, you know, it's a load of fucking <laughs> nonsense, but it's got some really interesting stuff in it. Um, there's some great music in the film. It's one of two films I saw this year where Adam Driver goes down on a woman in a comic fashion because he does it while he's singing a, a song. <laughs> um, Marion Cotillard also has to uh, perform a musical number whilst giving birth. It's it's it's. Hmm. I, I'll probably go back to it someday, and that's quite interesting because I only gave it like a six out of ten. Uh, yeah, certainly it's piqued my interest. Yeah. <laughs> Not that often happens. <laughs> You might really like it, Alan. It's, I quite like um, the music, though. Yeah, Sparks. And yeah. All right, shall we move on? If you don't like that, won't you pass the hat? Right along like that, won't you pass the hat? Yeah, if you all like that, won't you pass the hat? It's Vivo, I'm faster than your average cat. If you don't like that, won't you pass the hat? Right along like that, won't you pass the hat? Yeah, if you all like that, won't you pass the hat? Yeah, I've adapted to my habitat. You and I, we are one of a kind. Right, can I have a guess? Huh. Based uh, on yes. some lyrics that I heard there. Go on. Is it Tom and Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely <laughs> reference to a cat. I'm there is a sure reference to a cat. I heard the word cat. Tom in there as well. Um, unfortunately, no. It's like Tom uh, and Jerry re- go go um, salsa or something. No, like. I, I'm I'm afraid the reference to a cat is in the traditional jazz sense. Oh, of a the word. cat. It, it, it is a talking animal, however. And he is voiced by uh, fast becoming an extremely divisive figure. I think uh, he, he was everyone's favorite golden boy, lyricist, musical songwriter. Um, I think he's starting to piss people off now. Ah, uh, <laughs> Lin Manuel Miranda. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Well done, Calvin. I will accept that as the artist, Calvin. So that's a point for you. Oh, great. Right. Uh, okay, I can hear. Yeah, no, you said that. Though. He is singing most of that, and he wrote the song, I believe. So there you go. It is from the film Vivo, which is said in the lyrics, uh, and it's a yeah. song called One of a Kind. It was, um, I think, a Sony animation musical from this year. And mm. I quite like that song at the start. The The rest of the film wasn't hmm. really that good. but uh... It's got a lot of Lin-Manuel trying to rap, and he's just talking really quickly like this, and he can't rap, and it's really annoying. Fuck off. <laughs> got that Dwayne the Rock Johnson to do it. Mm. All right. Uh, next up. That was such a generic, rousing kind of ending song yeah. that I think it might even be a parody of those kinds Ooh. of songs. But it wasn't Ooh. really funny in itself. Very, uh, very astute. Because no one could possibly self. create something like that in 2021 and go, "Yeah, we're taking this seriously." It's not um, Smigadoon, is it? <laughs> no, I, I, I should have pulled uh. some songs from Smigadoon. Actually, I quite enjoyed that. Did you watch that at all, Carmen? No. It was enjoyable. Uh, hmm. No, it's not from Schmigadoon, but you are you are on the right lines. And I think what Alan was saying with it not quite being funny is um, <laughs> worth focusing on. Huh? It's not that um, Netflix one with Meryl Streep and Leonardo DiCaprio and everyone, is it? 
Oh, uh, no, but that's very, very good thinking. No, it's not Don't Look Up, the uh, mm. divisive Adam McKay comedy about the end of the world. Um, no, it is from uh, Marvel's Hawkeye TV series. That is, oh. uh, that is from Rogers mm. the Musical, which they go to um. watch on uh, Broadway in episode one. It's a show within the mm. show. So, yeah, it's like a musical about the Avengers saving New York, the oh, Captain okay. America story. Yeah, I can see, uh, yeah, they're not really... So you were very right, Alan. Yeah. It was it was like an intentional sort of musical parody, but uh, not actually funny because it's not a comedy. Fair Written enough, by yeah. Mark yeah. Shaman and uh, Scott Whitman, I believe, that song. So. Uh, hmm. Well, they know what they're doing. I'm, uh, I'm a big musical theatre guy, and I'll tell you now, I will not be listening to that song at any point. Uh, the future, so, yeah, yeah they obviously rattled that off pretty quickly <laughs> yeah all right all right one more for this round in the quiz let's see if uh you can get some points because calvin i think has one yeah. that's all we've got so far that's pretty shit guys so come on okay that's from the new space jam well done it yeah. is I don't know who the hell is singing. That, I'm afraid <laughs> it's a guy called uh, Big Freedia, apparently, <laughs> who I've never heard of in my life. Uh, Want to take a stab at the name of the song? Um, going Looney. Well done. <laughs> oh my god. Yes. <laughs> well done. Going Looney is the name of the song. Should we? Should we hear the rest of that clip? I can't, I can't believe I actually got that. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's exactly wow. what they, they imagined this would become in the 1940s or whenever they invented it. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. So at the end of that, Alan is uh, winning, Calvin. Alan has two points to your one. So uh, well, fair. Uh, better get your shit together for next yep. time. Yep. Anyway, uh, back to the films of 2021. We watched Coming to America. Do you remember that, Alan? That was... Coming to America. Ah. Yeah. Because because coming to America was uh, coming out straight to Amazon Prime. Mm, the second coming. Here's what we thought of that with Gareth. <laughs> 20 minutes in, I was thinking, this is okay. This is a lot better than I was mm. expecting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be okay. And it just sort of slowly, slowly let me down over the course of the two hours where it didn't quite pay off. Or that was, just didn't that go was the anywhere. problem. There was no momentum to the plot. It, it just felt like a series of sketches. And these are sketches we've seen before being awkwardly reheated. And you know what? To an extent, I was okay with that. Yeah. When when John Amos mm -hmm. uh, started complaining about various McDonald's items that mm -hmm. <laughs> McDougal's is nothing like, you know, they've got the they got the McMuffin, we've got the McScruffin. I <laughs> I, I laughed. I thought, yeah, that's that's funny. I could I could watch a whole film of him doing this. I'm gonna say I didn't hate it. It was all right. I quite enjoyed <laughs> it. I, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go to bat for it as you know the best comedy I've ever seen. But I I think. That in much the same way as we did a podcast about coming to America, they've sort of got together and done a little affectionate tribute to coming to America. Yeah, and it was sort of had a lot of it sort of had a lot of love in it, and it was it was all very nice. It was great. I I, I didn't there was no bits of it that I thought, oh god, they've ruined the original, or oh god, this is terrible. It was just like it was nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I my initial thoughts were this film's a bit depressing. Everyone's a bit too old. Eddie Murphy couldn't even be bothered to lose the belly this time. It's very prominent there. At least dressed uh, to cover it up, you know. <laughs> Don't wear yeah. the, the tight caftan. <laughs> James Earl Jones is like bedridden, <laughs> written well, into I... the film. Yeah. You never see him in the same shot as anyone else. They've got him propped him up like Alan Partridge on the on a canal boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, but it, you know it, I found it remarkable that this whole film hinges on retconning the first film so that we now know that Prince Hakim got raped. I thought that was a really <laughs> weird, arguably quite bold choice on the part of the filmmakers. Yeah, But the thing, the thing is, that rape is set in the 80s. 
And back then, that wasn't rape. That was just taking was advantage of someone on drugs. It was all right in the 80s. That was okay know. back then. <laughs> so stop putting your modern day morality onto this story, Sol. Oh, dear. So I think it is very sketchy up front. And that's fine, I think, for the right, we're back together and everything. It's I think the film's hits. problem is that it's very sketchy in the middle and the end as well. It never really <laughs> establishes a firm. You're right. Well, it does establish a plot in that Prince Akeem has a son. But you're right, there's no flow to it. I hadn't really put that together, but you you are right. You know, it's fine. They go they go to New York again. They they go to the old barber shop. Everyone's still there, except I thought very sadly Cuba Gooding Jr., who I was really hoping they, I, I was hoping they were going to get to just well. sit. <laughs> with yeah, you. I was yes, really hoping you. he'd be there, great. just sat without any catch. lines. He can't be too busy. <laughs> I like how all the old the old people at the barbers haven't aged at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, just exactly the same. What about? Uh, can we talk about Wesley Snipes? Well, this is something I wanted to say. You know, it's not that they just assemble every single actor from the first coming to America, so much as they assemble every single black comedic actor in Hollywood <laughs> for this film. And Wesley They're, Snipes. Everyone's there. And Wesley Snipes. No, but it's everyone. Borat's wife, who I've never seen in another <laughs> film, is in this film. <laughs> Lunell. Yeah. Uh, Tracy Morgan. Leslie Jones. Leslie Jones is great in this. Do, I mean, she's just doing what Leslie Jones does, but she's doing it very well. <laughs> I think the cast in general are pretty good in this. I, I, I wouldn't fault many of them. I, I wasn't massively keen on his son. Oh, I, I quite yeah, liked I him. I didn't know. I, I, I thought... didn't recognize the actor. Is he? Who is he? Because, because again, like you, Sol, I wasn't. I mean, he was all right, but you know. I, I looked yeah. up his credits. I didn't really recognize anything, but it seems like he's more of a comedian, sort of sketch guy, rather than a right, really yeah. bona fide actor. But I actually quite liked him. I thought that character could have been a lot more caricatured, and he mm. sort of played it fairly real. I really liked mm-hmm. the scene where they introduce him, and he's having the interview with the white guy, and. That just kind of casual racism level. I think they pitched that just right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I liked all that. I think it, it it just never went anywhere. He didn't get expanded enough. And then yeah. the and then the whole plot just uh, like the first film marches on. He sees a woman and and he's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll marry her. And then you know, falling in love with this the only other woman you've ever met, basically, <laughs> which is yeah. like you know, just because yeah. you have a good conversation with someone, it's like, oh well, we should get married, right? Yeah. And I, I felt like Prince Akeem didn't quite seem like the same guy he's obviously meant to have aged and yeah yeah but he didn't become, you didn't yeah. you didn't you didn't get to see any of the journey of him kind of becoming yeah. an older guy and kind of losing touch or whatever or, or like mm. going back into the old ways because mm. ultimately yeah. well, they live in a country and he is a ruler of a country that doesn't allow women to manage businesses <laughs> run yeah. their own businesses yeah. it's like we're like even in the eighties, that was pretty that's on shoddy. Him. He's been, yeah. and that, well, that's it. They 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 try and pay it a bit of lip service, but it just doesn't quite work when he kind of goes, "Oh, well, tradition," you know. It's like, yeah, but the the Prince Akeem we saw in the first film was all about breaking stand tradition. For this shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. So next Doria, like the country <laughs> next door to Zamunda, is called Next Doria. Yeah. Not even a look to camera. Just, we're going with that. We're going with that. It's unobtainium all over again. <laughs> but you can't really pretend it's a real country because then you really are being racist. And so here's a question for you. Is this all right? Eddie Murphy <laughs> doing that voice in 2021? Is that all right? Like, I know I couldn't do that voice. Well, that's what I said when we talked about the first film. He doesn't go full on. He's not like trying to do a Ghanaian accent or anything. It's just a sort I, I of vaguely right. a bit foreign... It's kind yeah, of like doing a Borat really... voice. Yeah, it's kind of Russian-y sort of Eastern voice. Does it count? But is, eh. but is you know, is Black Panther all right? I, I think it is. I think it's okay. It's like, Gareth, I think you'd be perfectly within your right to do a comedy character who's from a nation very suspiciously similar to South Africa, and you do a kind of... <laughs> you know, botched South African accent for the voice. I think that would be okay. If you it? think I'm doing my Nelson Mandela impression on this <laughs> podcast, you can think again. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm less comfortable with. Uh, Arsenio Hall being Rafiki out of Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, oh, yeah. that, that, that one was... definitely felt a bit dodgier. <laughs> I did go in thinking... That, yeah, the witch doctor. <laughs> I did go in thinking who's going to be, you know, the new character. There's going to be a new character. And then we, yeah, we're confronted with this really old kind of archetypical character yeah it was it was a weird yeah i don't know <laughs> but yeah i mean i'm i'm not gonna sit here as a, a white guy and tell us in hall what he's not allowed to do on that front i suppose it's uh <laughs> i feel embarrassed to admit this 
But I laughed when Eddie Murphy <laughs> said he was on fleek. Oh, God. And, uh, <laughs> and his daughters were unimpressed with that. One of those girls playing his daughters is actually one of Eddie Murphy's daughters. I assume oh, really as much, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know. know if he knew that. There's a lot of them around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would give this I would give this a seven, because it was perfectly nice. Nothing special. I th- I think I gave the first one an eight in a sort of act of extraordinary generosity. <laughs> but no, it is a genuinely good film. So with this film, like I like I say, at first I was like, okay, this is actually better than I thought. I'm on board. And it just slowly, slowly ebbed away from being any good and just lost every opportunity to grasp something. And that number just started dropping down. But even towards yeah. the end, I was going, you know what? This has been fine. I could give this a sort of a sturdy six. And I think I'd be comfortable with that. And then just the last 20 minutes, it's just like, uh, eked me down, eked me down. And I ended up at a five. And then they put outtakes over the credits. Got to take a point off for oh, that. Yeah. Sorry, that's the rules. Yeah. So... <laughs> I've ended up with quite a harsh four. I think that's very harsh. It's much better than that. It's I think be- it's it deserves better for you, Alan. It deserves but, better, but, but if you're going to put out on the credits, I, I respect that. What are you going to do? Yeah, you got to have a system. I went through the same experience as you, Alan, except that the the sort of spectrum I'm dealing with when watching this kind of went film from a high seven much, to a low much seven, smaller, <laughs> pretty much. Um, I ended up giving it a low six. And, okay. and I mean that is an incredibly generous six. That's yeah. you know five. Well, I gave it a harsh four, so and, I think that's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll call it. It's balanced out. Oh, that cheeky scamp, Gareth. Hey. Mm. All right. Moving swiftly on. We don't need to dwell on that, do we? <laughs> Wait a minute, I want to know what Calvin thinks about Coming to America. I, I haven't even seen Coming One America, so <laughs> I, can't, I can't possibly comment. That's a disgrace. It's a classic. It's an 80s classic of the comedy genre. I don't I don't respond very much to 80s films, I must say. American 80s classics. Well, even Eddie I've Murphy never understood the, the Ghostbusters thing. Never. What Bond films came out in the 80s? The ones where Roger Moore was too old to be well, taken seriously. Well, is it generally I, I, accepted that the 80s is the worst Bond decade? Uh, no, most people love it. And I like a really? good few films from there. Octopussy, of course, was in the 80s. Timothy um, Dalton was in the 80s, right? Yep, and I really like License to Kill. What is the worst decade for Bond? Uh, oh. How many Bond mm. movies do you think we're going to get this decade, Calvin? Do you think two? I think two's fair. I think maybe <laughs> three if the actor's really keen for it. Uh, but who is that actor? Well, who who knows? Oh, Calvin, maybe we'll wanna, know at some point. I want to hear your opinion on Sol's okay. uh, prediction for the new Bond. Oh, I was talking about this with Calvin when I saw him the other the other week. Go on then. Um, well, apparently Calvin doesn't remember anything from that night anyway, so I guess we can just do it again. <laughs> it was the booster. The booster mixed with the Jack Daniels and created a, <laughs> a mindless zombie. I'm I'm all in on Rahul Kohli, but uh, I can't even bet on him on the gambling sites. He's not even an option on them, so, you know. I like that thinking, though. A name that's not on the betting sites sounds like a good bet to me. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Do you know he's, who he's... Rahul Kohli is, Calvin? Nope. Judging by his name alone, do you think he's going to be Bond? <laughs> uh, I think he has a, a, a better chance than some. <laughs> Tiddles Raven. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. I, I think I could be the next Bond, actually. <laughs> I'm an unknown. I think being unknown is just the only category. <laughs> oh dear. He's dear. very attractive to women, though. The old soul. Well, uh, right. people mm. like Keanu Reeves, I'm riding that wave, as we know from Keanu Vember. I, I've had, I think... <laughs> is that why you've grown your hair out and let it go a bit greasy and lank? <laughs> I think I've had three people come up to me this month to say that I look kind of like Keanu Reeves. Like that's yeah. that's a lot, right? That's not bad. To say that I ha- yeah, to say yeah. that I actually don't really look that much like him. Yeah. Again, I will say he's sixty years old. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, next in the year we did Godzilla versus Kong, which was when <gasps> cinemas reopened around April. April time is what we made of that. So you like Godzilla films, Saul? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, now, now you're hesitating because you've seen Godzilla vs. Kong, whatever this film is called. Which, which combination combination of names is it? 
It's Godzilla vs. Kong, yeah. Okay, good. We should say, I, I think this film was pretty well received. Was that because no one had seen a film for 18 months? I do wonder. When it came out? Yeah, possibly. Probably. It was awful. It was... I, I couldn't quite believe just how terrible it was uh, in every aspect. It f- and if, mm. I, if I was watching this film and someone was like, oh yeah, this was made in like 1996... I'd be like, oh, cool. This isn't all right. But things well, yeah, have you changed. Like the 1996 one. But yeah, obviously, I would. It would have had to have been more practical, gra- practical uh, effects and stuff. That would have been cool. No idea what was going on at any point. Within sort of five minutes, they mention like Hollow Earth theory and <laughs> gravity, and I was like, all right, I'm out. So I really clicked off pretty quickly. Uh, not literally off the film, but you know, mentally. I'm annoyed because now you're putting me in a position of having to fucking defend this film. No, was, just go ahead and hate it with me. I was so. hoping to be the dissenting opinion here, but I don't think it's that bad. I think the other reason people like this one and felt like it was a step up from the last one is that a lot of them didn't go to see this in the cinema, but rather opted to spend £15 on a, mm, a home premiere. Like and so I think, you know, that's your sunk cost fallacy, really, isn't it? It's like Yeah, once you're you, pot committed by that point. What That's it, you've committed by buying it. So if you admit it's bad, that means you're yeah, you've the made a bad decision. That means you're an idiot. At one point, they have a teenager go, "Oh wait, if I hack into this computer system, I'm <laughs> save the world." With no real sense of irony, they kind of get a joke out of it of him guessing the password. But then he solves it all. Spoiler alert: he solves it all by pouring water on, well, whiskey, water, pouring liquid in the computer, and therefore breaking the Mecha Godzilla. And like well, he's, they didn't even have the dignity yeah. to have a scene earlier on where he, you know, accidentally spills his Mountain Dew all over his laptop, and so like that sort of precursor. Yeah, 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 the the setup. The entire film just felt like a, a hair's breadth away from full on self parody. Like mm. to the point, I, I made a note to the point that I genuinely was half expecting to see Mecha Godzilla like dunk Godzilla's head in a giant toilet and flush it or something like that, <laughs> and for them to just like. For them to both go and have a pint at the end of the movie and like pat each other on the back. And then there was there's was, there was several plot lines going on and <laughs> none of them made sense. I couldn't follow parts of the plot in this one. And if any like if if someone's gonna follow your bullshit Lovecraftian anime, we're gonna take over the world with monsters bullshit plot lines, surely I'm someone who's gonna follow it, because I, mm. I know the franchise, I like it overall. All it needed was a couple of the characters to go, what the fuck is going on here? This is mental. But they're not. They're all just like, oh, great. Okay, we've, got, we've popped into the hollow earth. This is okay. Let's follow the giant ape. If this was a Marvel movie, it would have been fine because you would have cut to Paul Rudd in the spaceship and Paul Rudd would have been like, are we seriously doing King Arthur right now? And then they would have <laughs> cut back to... Someone would have been like, what the fuck is going on? And then he would have been like, Come on, didn't you study King Arthur in, in high school? It would have been something like that. And that's partly why I think Godzilla King of the Monsters worked. Because that had that. There was a guy who was a podcaster. Oh, wait, wait. No, no, no. All right. Let me start with a positive, okay? Uh, the podcaster guy who's played by Brian Tyree Henry. He's the only one I remember I liked at him. all. And I think I liked I, him. Yeah, I think I, I like him as an actor, certainly. Well, he... he, he he was the only one who was bringing anything even remotely like a personality to this yeah. film. He, he he was committed to this character. I think the I think the character came across really well as being like, yeah, he's definitely a bit mental, but actually he's not just playing it mental, if you know what I mean. It, I it think felt the character, like it grounded. I think the character needed work, but I will yes. agree that it ultimately is probably the best character in the film. So alongside him, you had Millie Bobby Brown, who's fine, but didn't do anything. No, I don't like it. And then... This other kid... Stranger Things can suck it. This other kid who was apparently like, well, let's give him a New Zealand accent and hope that it's funny. That's... It oh, work. God, I forgot he's in it. Well, no, he is. He's... um. Do you not remember, Alan? He was in Deadpool 2. And it didn't really work in Deadpool 2, if I'm completely honest. And at the minute, they're trying to just cram him in places. But I don't think he's got that... He's not got but that he New Zealand obviously... charm where you can just l- leave mm. him be doing whatever he wants and he'll. But I think he was supposed work. to be funny in this. Yeah, he was a nerd, dumb, and it didn't really work, comedy yeah. fat kid. Yeah, yeah. I so kind of slag someone it. else off. Um, so Rebecca Hall is in it. She's fine. Um, I like know, Rebecca no, Hall. No kind of complaints yeah. there. But again, yeah, she didn't have much to work with. But then yeah. your leading man. So 
there's this leading man, and I'm like, who the hell is this? Is this like someone's cousin or something? He's so bland. He's got no charisma. They could act like it wasn't that a problem. They just had nothing. They didn't yeah, have yeah, that yeah. Charlton Heston presence, right? Um, anyway, it's Alexander Skarsgård. Oh yes, he is in this. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Didn't recognise him. I don't know. I don't know if I've. I don't, I've never seen him in anything where I would have thought, oh, it's him. Look. Skarsgård. Yeah, so you don't like the Skarsgård? Um, I, I, yeah, I don't even want to have a go at him because I don't think he was bad particularly. Obviously, I don't think not, it's his fault. There was fault. no material there to work with, but he he just didn't have that sparkle. It was just such a forgettable presence, which is not good for a Hollywood actor. Like that's and the and, and the thing was the set design, all these little the the little spaceships and the, all the costumes they were wearing. It was like watching. Joey from Friends in that with Gary Oldman. What's the film, What's the film called? The sixties TV show film, Lost in Space. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, Lost in Space. Yeah. And they had a guy doing a mind meld with it, but in a skull, in a giant sort of monster skull. Yeah, I didn't get that, but that was something like the. In order to mind meld, he was like having to harness the DNA of this ancient Godzilla kaiju. And that somehow meant they like had to be in the skull of the thing so he could like access its DNA or something. DNA is, of course, you know, most highly concentrated in the skull, as we know. <laughs> in the bones. <laughs> well you should you mean he's saying he should have been sat in a jar full of spunk. <laughs> <laughs> Monster spunk. Godzilla spunk would be massive. <laughs> be like in a being in a ball pit. <laughs> So this is why I can't drink bubble tea. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we've been very negative. Yeah, rightly so. No, I'm going to be a bit positive now. I think the action itself is really done really well. I'm just not interested in two I know computer not. generated things fighting. It's just all so fake to me. I, don't, I'm I know you not. I know you not. But I, I, I think the action was largely done very well. There were some very good fight scenes, very well choreographed, even if it's like digital choreography. And I, I did like the art design. I thought it was one of the film's saving graces. Really, was it had you know, yeah, a lot of it's digital and CGI, but you know, that's what this franchise is. Well, I'm not happy about this, but uh, what are you rating it then? Ah, <sighs> you're gonna get mad. Yeah, if it's anything <laughs> above a five, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a six. Ugh. Well, I gave it a three, and the more and more I talk about it, the more I want to knock it down further. So, better, better, better nail it in as a three <laughs> before I change my mind. Godzilla. <laughs> Calvin, did you watch this one on premium? on demand. Uh, no, no, I haven't actually, because I haven't seen the second Godzilla one yet. I really can't tell where you'd land with these films, actually. I don't think you'd like them, but you could, like, completely love them and be like, oh, oh, the big monkeys <laughs> fighting the lizard, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> I didn't much care for the first ones. Uh, well, no, actually, it was fine. God, uh, I saw the first Godzilla one, I saw the King Kong Skull Island one, fine with both of them, but just fine. Yeah, I doubt you'd be that into it, to be honest. They're a bit crap. Uh, (laughs) Music quiz. Oh. Yay. This round is the uh, original score round, so there will be no no lyrics. Yeah, so uh, for this one, I would like you to tell me the name of the film for a point, and I will accept the name of the composer for another point, if you uh, are so Mm. inclined. Great. All right. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> this is a Wes Anderson film. Does it, Alan? Uh, buzz, Buzz. <laughs> that Wes Anderson film. The Go French on. Dispatch, is that? Well it? done, yes, it is The French Dispatch. Ah, and it does good. sound exactly like you would imagine that film. Honestly, I've not like. seen that film. I don't think I've even seen the trailer. I've not heard any music from it. But that sounded like a Wes Anderson film. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, that's why I put this up front. I thought it would be very easy to guess based on... Do you want to, do you want to take a stab at the composer? It is someone he's worked with... Oh, I don't know. ...before. If Alan that. doesn't get it, can I have oh, a guess? Go on, you can have of it. Of course, yes. Well, it's it's one of two people, it must be, uh, and I'm going to go with Alexander Desplat. Well done, Calvin, it is. Yes. It is. All right. You can just picture Owen Wilson on a little bicycle with a big baguette, can't you? Say what you will about that film, it, it looked and sounded lovely. 
but I mean, that's what you get from Wes Anderson, <laughs> that's isn't what you it? Get so, from Wes Anderson. <laughs> so it doesn't so, make know. any sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 buzz, 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 buzz. Yes, Kevin. That is from Candyman. Yeah. Uh, as well, yeah, yeah and okay. as as for the composer, I'm. Uh, I, 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 it's not someone terribly well known, is it? Because I do remember looking them up, um, but I, I don't know the name. I'm not going to be able to recall it. Yeah, I mean, obviously that is the melody from the original by Philip Glass, but the composer of the new one is uh, Robert Akey and Aubrey yeah. Lowe working together, who you would have needed for a point. And of course, you don't yes. know who they are because who are they? <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is the music box track, the um, iconic Candyman theme being worked into the new film which I, I very much enjoyed actually are we going to come to talking about it at some point we, we are we are so I guess yay so hold it on I promise you I've seen something <laughs> I'm guessing it's from an action film that I've. This is a horror scale, mm. but that's a action base. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So I suppose we're looking for a horror film <laughs> with a lot of action <laughs> set pieces. Candyman. <laughs> uh, is it a Quiet Place Part Two? No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going, surprised right? with you, Calvin. Uh, and I'm kind of surprised with you, Alan, because there's a lot of noises and instruments at play here that are very in keeping with this franchise. Uh, um, no, it's Halloween Kills. Oh, God! Huh. Which uh, was composed Compound. by the team <laughs> of John Carpenter, Cody Carpenter, and Daniel Davies, which I think means that John Carpenter didn't do anything and he just got a credit, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right. Well, there's no way you're going to get this next one, but let's hear it anyway. <laughs> okay. That was uh, Clint Mansell, was your composer there, who's very good, mm. for In the Earth, which was a little oh. Ben Wheatley mm. film shot during the pandemic that I, I really enjoyed, actually. I'm not, it's quite rare that I properly click with Ben Wheatley. I know he's kind of a film darling, you know, but um, the most I've enjoyed one of his films, really, so, yeah. Anyway, all right, there's one more here. This is a five-clip uh, game, this one, so let's see. This next one you should be able to get in theory oh, but okay. let's hear it proper orchestra going on this is classic Um, that was Spider-Man No Way Home, but specifically oh. <laughs> a moment reprising the Danny Elfman theme from the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. I, I really enjoyed that little moment there. Did you applaud? Uh, I didn't applaud, but I was, I was, uh, I wasn't annoyed by the applause in that film from the other people. No one applauded that moment, but uh, I was annoyed when people applauded the Kingsman. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they'd all just been to see Spider-Man, so they were feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a time and place for it, you know? I, I, there's certain mm. big comic book 
moments and you know probably moments in no time to die where it might have been appropriate to clap i, I don't know but uh <laughs> anyway so at the end of that quiz you're drawing by the way so who cares like the whole thing's been pointless up until now <laughs> we've had fun along the way yeah next film alan what do you want to shout it oh uh, mortal Kombat. there he is <laughs> Mortal Kombat! <laughs> I was doing that the whole way through the film. <laughs> <laughs> I really was. And, um, like, literally just as we started uh, recording, everything was set up, uh, some cunty builders started hitting the floor with a hammer above me. So apologies in advance if um, if you hear an annoying, incessant banging they waited until like I set up and started recording, and now they've started doing it. So <laughs> when you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's what yeah, they say. That's true. And if you have a Mortal Kombat film, everything looks like a sort of badly choreographed, overly movie, saturated, like. <laughs> <laughs> cheaply shot. Yeah. So I mean, look, we we weren't exactly um, impressed with. The first attempt at a Mortal Kombat movie, where it had a certain uh, kitsch nostalgia charm. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. This new movie doesn't have that. It takes itself very seriously. It feels like, for the most part. I'll just lay out my um, broad strokes nutshell review. Really, this new movie is like very competently made. It's probably a far better made film than either of the previous Mortal Kombat movies. However. You can't make just like a straight down the line competent Mortal Kombat movie. You have to you have to give it to someone with like a vision for how they're gonna turn this ludicrous, stupid like video game series into a compelling film. You have yeah. to give it to someone with like some comedy chops or or you know, someone who's gonna bring something more to it. So as a straight down the line Mortal Kombat movie, I guess it's actually like for what it is, meeting it at its own level, yeah, it's actually pretty decent. But that's not good enough. That's <laughs> not enough. So yeah. it's terrible. But the, so, like Mortal Kombat, as in the story, was made up for a game, right? That that didn't need that didn't need significant backstory or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. I think structurally it works, you know, it sort of tells a story, it goes along. Like you're saying, it's sort of a better made film than the originals. But does is that good? Is that interesting? Um, because it's just no, I, f- people fighting, really, isn't it? I would argue it's a worse film or a, a worse piece of art, I guess, than the the first effort, which I can't believe I'm saying because that was a Paul W S Anderson joke. <laughs> but I, I, I c- but at least he brought a, a you know like a vision to it. At least he had a take on it. Whether or not it was good, the performances were bland. The character of Kano. The Australian kind of roughneck um, yeah. was c- comes in about twenty minutes in, and good lord, did I need that! Like I, I know it's not exactly Deadpool level, but the the fact that one of these characters had a personality was was something. And actually, I really enjoy in a, like a straight down the line American film when they put like a British person or an Australian person in it who's just like doing proper swearing. And um, just yeah. takes the piss. I I do enjoy that because of the juxtaposition, I suppose. So of course, I think that character got me through the film quite significantly. I'll tell you what bit I liked legitimately. Yeah. Unless you want to guess, there's one moment that I was like, "Oh, that was pretty cool." Ooh. Hmm. Was it when the guy's arms fell off? <laughs> no, it's when when that guy likes freezing stuff. Yeah. Like. He like slices a guy, a load of blood spurts out, and he freezes the blood into a dagger and stabs the guy with his own blood. <laughs> that's, I thought that that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> That is a proper bad guy move, that isn't it? Yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> I did wonder if that's um a move from the game that Maybe, they've yeah. like put in. It felt very like a special move you'd get in one of these games that had just been it felt too good compared to the rest of the yes. film to have just been thought up by them, you know. What about the actual fighting? Are you on board with that? 
Because for, for me, even for my layman's uh, eyes, I don't really care about the fighting scenes, as you know. But it also seemed a little bit slow and clunky. It just wasn't as slick as a film that is about fighting needs to be. Yeah, I, I, it all seemed... I mean, I often watch movies that are supposedly great action movies with great fights and don't think anything of them anyway. Yeah. It all struck me like pretty, like relatively well done fight choreography and stuff, but I just, I found it incredibly dull. But uh, I'll tell you what annoyed me. And I, I found this annoying me in a few places, weirdly. So that one of the characters loves making weaponry out of freezing liquid right but he bothers to put like little you know it, it's not like he just freezes water into a into a sharp spike he yeah. um he puts little details and decorative flourishes on them What's like a full is it as, as if he were like a a proper swordsmith like you know making a sword for years, you know, folding the steel over and engraving it with his name when he was done. It's like I, I just don't buy that you would you would bother to put in all the little f- decorative flourishes and things on this weapon. I had the same problem with Marvel's Eternals, which just came out. Alan, one of oh, yeah. Angelina Jolie's power as an as an Eternal seems to be that she can just manifest weapons out of like energy, and she does the same thing. She she doesn't just manifest a blade of energy. She manifests something that looks like a medieval halberd that a monk has, you know, slaved over with little with divots and like nuts and bolts on it. It's like well, that's. That's a functional thing. That's their, you know. You, why would you bother putting in the little things well, that are there? You know, you just it's, these people are, you know, they've been living a long time. They've really honed their skills. And if, if all you do is manifest weapons from energy, then you're going to start getting intricate about it, aren't you? It's just, it's just how. Yeah, you, well, it's, it's, they're the, artisans. The, the only justification for those sort of form over function details like nuts and bolts and things the only justification for that is that they are doing the equiv- like to be fair if i could do that and manifest anything i might get to a point where i start manifesting like oh i'm going to do a replica chainsaw from evil dead 2 <laughs> with all the same blemishes on it and yeah, you know exactly. and i guess maybe these are just fucking nerds who are like Ooh, I love this uh, particular um, sword from you know 14th century Macedonia, <laughs> <laughs> but there's just no spark or magic to it. It's just this is a boardroom meeting where all the studio execs sit around and go, mm, "Can we put a bit of comedy in there? Oh, can we put a bit of edge in there as well?" So it justifies the, the R rating. Yeah, yeah. They weren't we, they weren't yeah. afraid to throw the swear words in. I guess they already they were committed to having blood and guts. So. I well. think so, based on the uh, violence. Yeah, I think they committed to an R rating for that. Which, by the way, looked a bit cheap here and there. Some, some it looked blood terrible. Look pretty dodgy, didn't they, for for twenty twenty one? I've seen praise for the uh, CGI in this movie, but the blood was certainly at the front of the film. Yeah. The blood splatters looked awful. It just looked like After Effects. You know, yeah. let's just color color seen the grass in a bit red. YouTube videos because there's a blood so splatter. <laughs> And it really got on my tits, to be honest. So yeah. I give it a two out of ten. That is a bit harsh. I mean, I basically feel the same way. I give it a four. So mm. you know, four's probably a more accurate reflection of the film, like taken on its own terms. Yeah. Uh, but as I say, I I just don't like this film has to justify itself existing more than a normal film because it is a a reboot of a you know dreadful franchise to begin with that we we didn't need this. And if you were going to do it for the fans, do it better. <laughs> do it justice. Just do it better. I didn't hate it. I just... Mortal Kombat! Like, that, that 2 out of 10 doesn't reflect me getting angry and despising it. It just reflects such indifference that, yeah. you know, like, aggressive indifference that I felt. <laughs> aggressive indifference. <laughs> and also, like, I had a better time watching the Paul W.S. Anderson movie, so I couldn't rate it higher than that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, and I think I gave that a two, so... Yeah, yeah. alright, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat! <laughs> yes, of course, that, that was us talking about our thoughts on Mortal Kombat! 
<laughs> See, I can't shout it without sounding like Shaggy from Scooby Doo. <laughs> yeah, what was that? About? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I had laryngitis recently, Alan, and it's really fucked my voice up. <laughs> <laughs> my ability to like hit certain notes and do certain things with my voice. Hmm. All right, Mortal Kombat. That was a load of shite. Uh... <laughs> Have you, that's the one you've seen, isn't it, Calvin? <laughs> but no, no. the Forever Purge was that a load of shite? Mm. Mm, let's find out. Here's a here's a spoiler for you. Go on. for the Forever Purge. Bit crap, wasn't it? Ooh, really? <laughs> now refresh me, Alan, because you really loved the Purge franchise, didn't you? You were really positive about those other films. Um, I don't know if love is the word I would use, but like giving them seven out of ten consistently. Yeah, over dashing the top out four seven, films is pretty good going for you for this kind of oh. franchise. That is love. It didn't it didn't pull me in at all. Well, I, I'm I'm really surprised, Alan, because uh, I mean. I'm just going to lay my cards out here. This is by by a fairly substantial margin, I would say, my favourite of the franchise. Um, I was really quite impressed with this when I went to see it back in July. Um, Why? What? Well, first of all, like, it, it, so we we spoke about how astonishing it is when you watch the first Purge movie that that movie predates a Donald Trump presidency, right? Mm. It predates him even running for for you know office. Um, well, uh, did you not think it's fucking astonishing that this movie was you know made before the January sixth insurrection on the um, Capitol building and in, in Washington? Again, it, like it felt like they had completely tapped into the zeitgeist yet again in a way that was really quite uncanny um okay maybe that was perhaps slightly let down by the fact i watched it 11 months later okay well yeah like say it it it, it predates all that <laughs> I so. admit, but to be honest with you it's just i don't weren't the weren't the earlier purge films a little bit more subtle than this no i don't think so <laughs> i don't know maybe not i don't know this one just didn't work for me all oh, it's basically just like ah americans but what if you had to be a, a refugee? Ah, yeah. Think, think well, on. that's it. I, I think the best kind of Purge movies are the ones that feel like they could equally be an episode of South Park. And that is exactly what I got out of this. The, <laughs> hey, now the Americans have got across the border to get into Mexico. Eh? Look, I, I think the premise here, the, the premise of the Purge is great in general. We spoke about that in our Purge episode. This film, I think, is the first time we get a genuinely great twist on that premise that gives it a shot in the arm. And for me, I thought this film felt genuinely like horror, like it tapped into some genuinely disturbing ideas that the rest of the franchise doesn't really get into. I mean, you're bordering on post-apocalyptic fiction. Obviously, I love my zombie movies. I think maybe... Mm. I just get something out of this that you don't. But um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, the idea you have to hole up one day out of the year and ride out a shitstorm is one thing. The idea that that leads to the, you know, out and out downfall of society through a unpleasantly realistic political lens. I mean, obviously, this isn't going to happen in real life, but it's it, it, there are parallels that are um, not that nice to think about. And also, I think you know it's 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 the biggest, most like bombastic entry in the franchise to date because they're they're doing such a big premise. But I also felt like it was the film that was the most willing to kind of grapple with the lunacy of what they're doing, you know, head on instead of just kind of making you know pretend that it's real cinema. It's not. It's the Purge. But I like the enclosed stories. I like people being trapped together and stuff like that, and that and creates the dramatic element of it the the tension yeah i mean i i do for like three four movies but this is what the fifth sixth purge it's like right it's time to do something new let's let's do it and they they i thought it was a really yeah. good fresh spin on on the franchise it felt very much like a purge movie but uh the, the, i mean the one complaint i'll have i'll i'll hold up and say is that um i'd say there's only about an hour of actual movie there yeah and then, like, it was as if the film then just, like, 
ran out of money and just had to kind of coast to the end, which, I, I, you know, is when they go off to the desert and everything. And, you know, because we've seen our Mexican hero being treated like shit. But then it's obviously not that simple, straightforward, because the, the ranch owner is also established as a really nice man who takes care of his employees and his son. He's just is... raised a racist. Oh, but then when, what about, like, you know, why doesn't he just move to a different ranch? Like, why don't he just go and get a job somewhere else? Because he's a, he's a magic horse whisperer. He has magic powers over horses. So obviously he's not going to struggle to get a job anywhere. Well, he's, we see, we he's, see that he's undocumented, scene. isn't he? I mean, <laughs> is he? Uh-huh. I see. I seem to remember with the whole crossing the border thing, they sort of make some parallels. Well, uh, yeah, there's definitely some discussion of that. And then it turns out that the woman who's in it, she's really good at shooting in that because she used to live in Mexico and she learned to be good at shooting because of the cartels. Don't know why you're turning your nose up at that one. Um, <laughs> you can't see my nose. You don't know where it is. So what's wrong with that? There are cartels in Mexico. Yeah. It is worth learning to shoot if you live there now. Is it? If you're a young woman who, who might need to defend herself. Yeah, Mexico's become quite a dangerous place these days, Alan. Hasn't it always been like that? Not really, no. The The rise of the cartel is a fairly recent uh, development. Surely that was the 70s, 80s. Yeah, but they, I mean, they've really taken hold over the they're they're more of a deal than they were back then i think you know back then it was like organized crime whereas now it's like we we run entire towns you know it's that kind of uh yeah i was just reading the wikipedia thing and it says yeah those two are are, they've crossed illegally into america to get away from the cartels trying to get them i think they're using their um contacts to get back the other way in reverse aren't they that's kind of the Uh. because and that's something that i love with this film is that it presents us with the sort of premise that in any other film would be on an international scale like a worldwide pandemic you know but it is as simple as cross the border into mexico because it acknowledges that america is just slightly more unhinged than the rest of the world and i th- i like that i think that's very believable that america would just stick it you know will itself into a kind of apocalyptic scenario and mexico mm. and canada across the border would just be like what the fuck like <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I don't know, I just, it, it, it's this ludicrous premise, and I just, I love seeing this sort of high concept play out. Ooh, what's, how is this going to go down, you know? Maybe this makes sense, you know, you like all those zombie films and stuff, and they're all crap, so it does make sense you'd like this. Yeah, but I mean, again, Alan, you like the, the other Purge movies, so you can't well, you know. get on some high horse about it. Cause I've only also... given them like sixes and sevens, it's not like I love seven them. Seven out of ten! From you! Yeah, that's, that's, good. that's a solid seven. Yeah, from you. That is an astonishingly positive <laughs> score. I'm going to look at what I actually gave these other films. Hang on a sec. I think you gave them all a seven, pretty much. First two. Seven, seven, six, six, I think you guys say. Yeah. And then this one. Yeah, well, what would you give this one? I give this one a three. Fucking hell, what is wrong with you? Because I just didn't, I, don't, I honestly didn't care about any of it, and I didn't, I, I, it definitely did not grab my attention. I was not in in it at all and so you know yeah, obviously think, that that is something like maybe if i could have i think you were in a good mood when you watched like i think i don't know you were you were all loved up or something when you watched the last purge <laughs> i was movie, in love with it? racism and uh, when uh, I watched this. But, and now this one you're busy at the moment you're annoyed you've got to like get something watched you got too much on you're like oh, for fuck's sake probably not paying attention to it I, I, I just don't get this. I, I give this one a seven, which I think is the highest score I've given any of them. And I, I yeah, I think it's the best one. I'm going to go purged right now, Alan. Yeah, well, it's that time of day. It is. Got a big one brewing up. Ooh, controversial, Ooh. divided opinions there. Yeah. yeah, we still don't know the answer. Interesting. Well, I know my answer. <laughs> Calvin, have you seen... No, nope, nope. I, I really am interested to know what you think of that film when you do get round to it, inevitably, Calvin, because... I will do eventually, but see, see some of the, the a lot of these are like things that I'm not going to pay extra to see. Of course, Actually, yeah, no, for, okay. Forever Purge is probably on Amazon Prime now, isn't it? Because don't probably. they own it or something? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. What would you pay to see Forever Purge? Um, uh, If it was included as part of a subscription of about... Nine ninety nine a month, along no, with a load of other things. It's over and above. 
But oh, someone says, um, look, I would... you can watch this tonight. It's going to cost look, you this yeah, much. It's, it's a, you've got amount? to pay to rent it. Uh, $2.99. Ooh. I was going to say, I'd probably go up to three quid. Yeah, That's a lot. Huh? Yeah. That's a lot for a film. Is it? <laughs> I, don't, I think three pounds isn't that much. For... Well, I've never bought a film new, so uh, I only buy things in <laughs> charity shop. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid we've overrun our time slot here and we're going to have to leave the rest for next time. But do be sure to tune in for that one because we've still got reviews of the likes of Matrix Resurrections, The King's Man, and of course, No Time to Die still to come. You want to hear what Calvin thought about that? Or you've already watched his YouTube video, fair enough. Okay, well, listen to what I've got to say about it. And of course, we'll be finishing off our music quiz. Thanks very much for listening. And if you would like to hear the full versions of these reviews, you have to join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dim returns. It's very reasonably priced, so go and check that out. And thank you very much for all your support during 2021. <laughs>